I just wanted to come here. To Winkies? This Winkies. Okay. Why this Winkies? It's kind of embarrassing. Go ahead. I had a dream about this place. Welcome to Post Culture Presents First Impressions. My name is Sam Roberts. I'm a writer and artist in Portland, Oregon, and the founder of Post Culture. This podcast series is about my first impressions watching movies that other people have widely regarded as classics. How it works is first, I'll talk about the movie itself, my experiences with it, any sort of prejudgments or biases I might have before watching. And the second half will be me sharing my candid thoughts and first impressions right after watching it. So basically, I'll have an introduction, uh, there'll be a small break while I watch the movie, and then I'll come back and talk about it. For episode one, we'll be looking at David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. Written and directed by Lynch, this movie came out in 2001, and like much of his other work, has been very polarizing for audiences. Even then, it's still considered to be one of his best works, probably even his masterpiece. Even though I've never seen Mulholland Drive, I considered myself a major fan of Lynch's works for years. Growing up, mentioning his name was like using a secret password to identify yourself as a weirdo and a film nerd to other weirdos and film nerds. Being a fan of his was something I had a lot of personal affinity for, and getting my hands on a tape of Eraserhead at 15 was one of the most exhilarating moments of my teenage years. But then, over the years, I started to lose my excitement for his work. Uh, when I was first developing a palette for film, and I guess art in general, I used to think that really thick, obtuse symbolism and imagery that was mystifying and difficult, um, if not impossible, to access was the sign of a talented artist. It could really be utter nonsense and bullshit, but as long as it was communicated in a way that made it sound important and profound, uh, I would buy into it and think it was great. As I've grown up, I've discovered that while I do like mystery and symbolism and depth of meaning, I do prefer for there to be some kind of logical consistency and grounding. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love metaphor, I love style, I love weird avant-garde crap, but when it is anchored in nothing but weirdness, with no substance attached, no payoff, no meaning, I don't like it. Um, I don't like abstract representations for the sake of abstractionism. To me, those works feel more like cheap, directionless, artificial approximations of storytelling and are quite boring and tedious, um, representing the creator's ego more than anything actually meaningful. Wow, I'm really going in on <laughs> those sorts of films. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that David Lynch is one of those hacks. Um, despite my taste changing over the years, I do still have a lot of respect for his work, but I guess I'm just trying to say that this is why, as I developed over the years, this is why I never sought out Mulholland Drive. But I am interested in revisiting his oeuvre, and what better place to start than Mulholland Drive, um, which, as I mentioned, is considered by many to be his masterpiece. I really know nothing about it, uh, other than that it is a mystery noir set in L.A. and stars Naomi Watts, all elements that I like and am interested in. Um, I know literally nothing else about it. So... I'm going to go watch it now. I'll be back in about two hours to discuss my first impressions. I'm sorry. I'm just so excited to be here. I mean, I just came here from Deep River, Ontario, and now I'm in this dream place. 
but you can imagine how I feel. Okay. I have a lot of thoughts to sort through. First, I'll just say it. I'll just lay it out there. I loved this movie. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of watching it. And um, I actually sort of hate myself for saying this because the film is utterly incomprehensible. And yet I'm, I'm in love with it. I'm saying it was brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular. I won't summarize it because I'm assuming if you're listening, you've already seen it. And if you haven't seen it, um, this probably won't make much sense. And uh, just be aware that there may be some spoilers. But wow. Wow. What a confusing, awkward, uneasy, terrifying, grotesque movie. It's lucid and strange and erotic and intimate. And I know I am definitely going to need to watch this at least a few more times before I can fully wrap myself around it. Uh, This time I was struggling to keep up, untangling each scene, unsure what parts are relevant, how it all connected, trying to anticipate what what could be coming, um, caught off guard by the oddness of it all. So yes, I will definitely need to watch this again. I'll probably watch this again as soon as I'm done with this recording. Um, I just, I, uh, I need to make sense of it all. Uh, To be honest, I was actually very unsure about it at first. Um, It opens with this full-blown disorienting what-the-fuck moment with that jitterbug contest. And the first 20 or so minutes... Were just so strange and so alien and unrecognizable as anything approaching actual human experience. Um, I just really wasn't connecting with it. There's this moment where Naomi Watts as Betty is... uh, I hated this scene so much. Um, She's descending through an airport on an escalator arm in arm with this old woman, Irene. And she's just gasping and smiling and in total bliss and bewilderment and amazement that she finally made it to LA. And the whole scene is like a wash in golden light and soft focus. And it is just completely insane. And it was this moment that I started to feel a lot less excited about watching it. Um, (laughs) Kind of a, what the hell did I get myself into moment? It was definitely confirming my biases. Um, that I mentioned in the intro of the podcast about uh, just the pretentiousness of these sort of um, avant-garde films at times. But um, those doubts were pretty quickly quashed, and by the first Winky scene, I was so fully invested. Uh, I guess I realized at that point that the dreamlike experience so far wasn't just purposeful, It was being expressly communicated to the audience on purpose. This allusion um, to dreams, to fantasy. And in that scene, um, we get somebody recalling a specific dream. And then the boogeyman from that dream, that witch person, monstrous apparition, I'm not sure, appears at the end of the scene. And it, it pretty quickly establishes that the boundary between fantasy and reality is illusory and things aren't as they seem and it also sort of hints at the prospect of fate Um, so some very interesting sort of expectations are set with that winky scene and at that point I was just fully strapped in I was like okay I'm here I'm ready for this let's do it and the whole rest of the film was just excellent. Um, After that point, after that winky scene, I feel like the sense of dread and unease was inescapable. Um, I think precisely because there's really no way to anticipate what could happen next. Literally anything could happen. 
Um, a demon person could just casually step out from behind a wall and you could suffer a heart attack out of nowhere. Um, having that sort of possibility opened up in front of you in a reality that had just been shown to be malevolent or at least indifferent is really scary because <laughs> you're not sure what to expect. The narrative does some surprising things and I would really love to know what sort of direction David gives his actors to get such strange, surreal performances from them. The movie is remarkable just due to the really strange line readings alone. Absolutely nothing about what the characters do or say is natural at any point. Um, everyone almost seems to know that they are some terrible Hollywood cliché. And I don't say that as a criticism. Um, in fact, the themes of the movie seem to be about the concepts of performance and persona. So the roles that people want to play and the roles that are predestined for them. There's also a really clear fantasy here about wanting to be other people or at least someone else. Uh, false identities and acting are recurrent elements, um, as are the general machinations of Hollywood. So escaping, being someone new, acting, pretending. Um, you know, you can just at any point just forget about yourself, your mistakes, your heartbreak, your guilt, your shame, and become somebody else. Start over. Characters... Uh, we're constantly occluding the real with fantasy as well, so in really literal ways, so with wigs and costumes. Then uh, the silencio scene happened. Uh, no hay banda, there is no band, which is to say nothing is real. Everything is an illusion. Nothing is as it seems. Um, so that's like the really obvious takeaway, but also... What I found really interesting, it kind of plays back into fate is, you know, everything is pre-recorded, predestined, pre-decided. You know, um, this is the girl. There is no escaping it. Not even in your fantasies. Speaking of fantasies, the structure of the fantasy versus reality elements were really interesting to me. And... I'm not sure if that's totally decodable. I know that Mulholland Drive was meant to originally be a TV pilot. And I know with Twin Peaks, much of that was made up along the way. So I don't really know necessarily how much of this has deeper meaning. But then again, it might become more clear on subsequent viewings. I don't know. Um, I know the easy, obvious reading of the fantasy versus reality comparison is that the first portion of the film, uh, the Betty and Rita story, is a dream. Uh, a dream manifested, you know, by Diane's guilt over having Camilla killed. Um, the unresolved heartache and jealousy from that relationship. And that makes sense. Obviously, there's a lot of references to dreams throughout the movie, it could very easily be that. That isn't totally satisfying to me, though, and I do think there might be something more there. It feels just a little too literal. And so I'm wondering if the Betty and Rita story is possibly more than just a dream. Because even though she suffered amnesia, Rita is lucid throughout that sequence. It's like she knows there's more beneath the surface. There's a bigger truth that they are being kept from seeing. And they know they're not themselves, or at least Rita knows she's not herself. And it feels to me less like a dream and more like purgatory. Or some kind of, some sort of liminal space where... There's definitely a wish fulfillment fantasy element, but the horrors 
and the mistakes and the pain of the other life is still very much felt and very much present. There's also a lot of really clear thematic symmetry between the two different stories. And again, I'll need to watch it a second time, but it isn't linear. Uh, in fact, the two stories are recursive and fold back in on themselves like a Mobius strip. And I've seen Lynch's work referred to as a Mobius strip before. And I feel like uh, with Mulholland Drive is probably one of the best examples of that. Which, you know, this leads me to the box that Rita unlocks. And when she does that, it effectively ends the fantasy, transporting us back to the reality in which Betty is actually Diane. Um, you know, clearly the box could represent consciousness. It could represent her repression or her guilt or her shame that then becomes unlocked. It sort of bursts the bubble, breaks the fantasy, brings her back to the real world where she has to actually deal with the consequences of her actions. Um, again, that kind of lends itself to that more literal dream versus waking state interpretation. Uh, I I don't know. It fits, but I'm also wondering if perhaps that box really could be a portal into another world, into another timeline, another reality, maybe a place where things are more malleable. Um, I'm not sure. I once read that Lynch's films are actually viewer-created films, that the meaning is ultimately left up to the observer. It's kind of a pretentious take, but uh, it's also a really interesting view of the art form, that the experience of watching a film becomes participatory rather than a passive activity. And if you don't put in the effort and meet the film halfway, then you probably won't like it. Does that mean that most of what makes this film interesting is our own projections onto it? Possibly. I don't think that's a bad thing, though. Uh, so a few other thoughts, some tangential thoughts, I guess, is I was really surprised by the romantic element. Um, as I would mentioned, I really knew nothing about this movie at all. So I wasn't expecting that, let alone a lesbian romance. The chemistry and sexual tension between them was pretty obvious from the beginning, but I just chalked that up to it just being weird. Um, I didn't think it would actually go there, let alone be the entire driving plot of the movie. In the third act, I was a little disappointed by the duplicitous, you know, manipulative, evil bisexual trope. But um, at the same time, it was consistent with the themes of the film. The cowboy was interesting. Um, I can't believe I've made it this far and I have not mentioned the cowboy. He really seemed to me uh, to be a character separate from the distinctions of fantasy and reality, thoroughly aware of the different paths and experiences of the characters. And I think that what he tells the director about how a man's attitude largely largely influences the trajectory of his life is possibly like the key and the, the thesis statement to this entire film. In the context of Diane, her sad life is the result of a sad attitude. I also found it really interesting when he referenced the buggy and driver because that recalls the concept of fate. Um, traditionally in the past, that's a metaphor that's been used to describe fate. So in the context of the film, it seems very intentional um, that that's what he's referring to, and that might even be him. He might be the rep a representation of fate. And it seems like what he wants people to do is use their free will to cooperate with him. If you fight against your fate, it can create problems for you. I didn't interpret him to be sinister and malevolent. 
even though he was very uncomfortable. Instead, he seemed more like a, a neutral being that exists above and beyond the timelines of the movie. Another stray thought is I really enjoyed that peek at the duality and depth of Betty when we see her practicing for the audition. Uh, first with Rita and then later at the actual read through. And psychic duality is a recurring theme of Lynch's work um, on and off screen. So that's no surprise, uh, but I found that to be really compelling. And Naomi Watts acted the hell out of it. Um, actually, I'll just take a moment to say everybody did a really great job, but Naomi Watts, holy shit. She um, was incredible. Absolutely incredible. <sighs> but yeah, um, I still have so much more to work through and think about, but my first impression is I definitely recommend it. I wish I hadn't waited so long to watch it. I love a good Hollywood tragedy, and it is weird enough to engage your thinking and to participate in the film while still being accessible. It's not too out there. It's exhausting. It's hypnotic. It's Byzantine. It requires a lot from you, emotional and intellectual investment. It's also really dark. It's unsettling. I'll be thinking about this for days. Uh, but yeah, these are the sorts of spells that David Lynch casts so well and just a great film all around. So that's it. Those are my thoughts. I will be back next week with a new episode. This time around, it will be about Kill Bill Volume 1. And I will see you then. Thanks for listening. No, I, Banda, there is no band. Il n'est pas de orchestra. <laughs> <laughs>